school or whatever it is that you do. And um, which, by the way, I never knew until I did this part of the job how evident it is that you all are doing that during the service. And it's really greatly entertaining for me to watch a frustrated spouse jab another one awake. And um, so that's great. Um, you know, when I was in Pentecostal, that's, that's how we got our naps in during the extended prayer times. The only scary thing is if anyone ever laid hands on you where you were sound asleep. And that has happened on me on more than one occasion. And embarrassingly for my family, my father, we, we left two churches because of it. Um, or were asked to leave. But anyway, the, the, the details aren't important. Uh, Acts 13, though, we're going to roll up the sleeves here this morning. We're going we're gonna, to, uh, if time permits, we're going to conquer about 30 verses. So we're going to go, a little, we're going to move a little bit quickly, and we're kind of going to do an overview. Um, and uh, yeah, well, who knows, if we have to, then I'll shut it down, and we'll do part one and part two. Uh, the sermon will be done for next week, and I can beat the Baptist to the buffet. So all is well that ends well. And so... Uh, but, but I really want us to take a second to take a look at this message that Paul delivers. Um, I, am, I am deeply convinced that the, the, the Bible in and of itself can either be helpful or very unhelpful in our spiritual formation. And, and the scripture, like all works of literature or, or authorship or, or stories, uh, they, they, it has to be read in such a way that we understand the basic rules for interpreting the text. If we don't, th th then we create, um, we create scenarios in which the scripture, the truth of scripture, is isolated, taken out of context. It's twisted. It's, it's, it's taught to mean something that it really doesn't say. And what's amazing is that as you press into the scripture and as you read church history and the development of Christian doctrine, it's amazing how oftentimes scriptures actually are portrayed to mean the very opposite of what they say. Quick example, I know I can't do this very often uh, this morning because I said we we're going to stay focused. And, and, uh, but so, so, for example, a lot of times you'll hear believers quote things like, um, um, God is too holy to look on sin. And you will hear people say that. And then the implication then becomes, if you're in sin, God doesn't really draw near to you or look upon you. But what's interesting is, is that a phrase in Scripture? Yes, it is. But very rarely do we take the time to actually look up what exactly is that reference. Well, if you go and look up the reference, it comes from one of the prophets, and right now I didn't do my homework. I'm being spontaneous here, so I didn't have it written down. Um, you'll have to Google it later. Use the Google. Um, but uh, that passage says, your eyes are too holy to look on sin, and the next line says, so why do you do it? Uh, the whole point of the passage is in his utter holiness, God still looks upon us in our sin. And yet it's literally quoted to communicate the opposite idea that there is distance in God because of his holiness. That, that's just one example. And so it's really important. By, scriptural reading is a critical part of our uh, spiritual formation in part because spiritual growth comes from what you're willing to unlearn as much as it comes from what you're willing to learn. So, so I'm always interested in not just hearing about your journey, about what is God teaching you, but, but what is it that the Holy Spirit has led you to unlearn so that you are in a healthier place, more aligned with the truth. And so that we want to take the scriptures from the scriptures viewpoint, which is why we have a very simple way of articulating the way we attempt to read and interpret and teach the Bible to Christ Community Church. And it is through reading it through the, 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 the lens of his story, first and foremost, meaning God's story. It is his story. Secondly, it is their story. Finally, it is our story, and by our story, I mean the collective tradition of the streams of Christianity up until today, and then, in a little more personal way, our story as a faith community, 
And then finally, we read it as my story, which we begin to ask ourselves, based on what we understand from his story, their story, and our story, how might the Spirit be calling me to respond in obedience so that then this begins to affect and impact my story? Now, this is very, very important because in the Bible Belt, most of us are, led, are, are taught to read the Bible first and foremost as my story. So I go to the scripture, bypassing his story, their story, and our story, looking for insights that have to do with my story. Well, when I've done that, I've approached the scriptures from a, ver from a starting point of my own self-interest, and therefore I am ready to begin to grossly misinterpret the scripture and misapply it. And it's not that God doesn't speak to us personally through the scripture. I'm not taking away from that. But the overall study is we want to really understand what the story that's being told in scripture. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out that'll get me in a lot of trouble. And uh, that, that'll just keep everybody interested. Now, the science isn't, uh, the mathematical equations aren't precise. I'll, I'll give you that. But, you know, you might even say, in some ways, very little scripture is written to us. And in another way, you can say at least a third of the commands of scripture aren't even given to us. But most of us are taught to read the scripture, to flip it open, to read a command, to start figuring out how to apply it to our lives. But that's not how it's written. Most of the scripture's commands are actually written to an entity that has has served its purpose and is no more, which is the entity of Old Covenant Israel. The majority of the scripture is about the story of Old Covenant Israel and the way that God called them, used them, and fulfilled his promises to them, thus displaying his faithfulness and setting the stage to transition for all of humanity this understanding that there's been a shift in the way that we approach God, that we've moved away from an old covenant model of mediated religion and into a new covenant where the Holy Spirit is as close as the breath of your lungs because he actually dwells in the center of your own soul. And we recognize that we live life not out of an attempt to get into unity with God, but from a revelation of the unity that he has created himself with us that he's done all the work and we see this take place throughout the story of israel another way that you see an example of this in the bible belt is that a lot of people are taught to read the bible about as though it's the apocalypse the end of the age like sometime soon all of this is going to get wrapped up and even though jesus said you'll never know when it's going to happen it hasn't stopped us from creating an entire industry of writing books about when it's going to happen. And so, and so we, 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 we propagate a lot of fear and able to, and as, as an attempt to help people see, hey, so this is the end of the world like the Bible talks about, and therefore, you know, it's 666 on your arm, that's actually your debit cards. And so pretty soon the bank's going to be wanting to put your debit card on your wrist or in your forehead and i don't want to be unfaithful to jesus but that sounds pretty great to me get my wallet or my kids take my debit card and so uh, i'll always bleep have it right here so uh but but we create this preoccupation when in reality there is an end of the age taking place in the scriptures there is an apocalypse it's the apocalypse of the old covenant it is the end of the old covenant world and the breaking in of the new heavens, the new earth, of the new covenant world that God has brought in the coming of Jesus. That becomes critical for not just reading the Bible, but for understanding the gospel, that the key elements of the gospel are the kingdom of God and the new covenant that comes in Christ. These are the predominant themes the predominant themes are not how to avoid an unfortunate situation after you die. But that's primarily how we communicate the gospel. So we're going to highlight this as we look at Paul's message because it becomes very important that we understand what the gospel meant to Israel, what the gospel meant to first century Gentiles, 
And now what does the gospel mean for those of us who are living in the afterworld of God fulfilling all his promises to Israel? So we'll look at that as we walk through here. So let's jump in here. And uh, what I did is I, I gave plenty of notes, but those of you who are fearful, have no fear. The notes are so long because I was able to put the entire text that we're going to be looking at right in your notes. So, of course, you're welcome to open up your Bible, make your own marks and notations. Some things in this text that are critical to be highlight this morning. And so I just want to encourage you. My goal is so that we have a clearer vision of the gospel as articulated from the scriptures so that we have a clearer vision of ourselves and what we're called to do and be as a community. Now, if this means that you're stretched and you're invited into some space to unlearn some things, I am more than happy for us to sit down and talk about that journey together, either in a small group or one-on-one -on -one over coffee or a Reuben sandwich. I love to do those sorts of things. But just remember, you have to make a different, you have to differentiate between, am I being stretched because Artie's annoying? Now, that's a very real possibility. Um, I've already annoyed some of you just even in the little bit of time that we've interacted here this morning. I've got some, uh, I've got some carryover annoying irritations from my family here on the front row. So I, I, I don't want to pretend like that's not a possibility. You may just be annoyed because Artie is annoying. It's part of my Judas ministry. And so, um, but you might be frustrated because I've simply highlighted what the scriptures say. And it's very important for your own journey that you discern, am I annoyed by Artie or am I bothered because the scriptures don't seem to be supporting the man-created systems of doctrine that were handed down to me or even forced upon me. If that's the case, you are welcome to reevaluate your thinking in light of the scripture. So let, let's create some space to do that. So Acts 13, verses 13 through, we're going to look at 13 down through uh, 40. Three, but let's start with the first 10 verses. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. John left them and went back to Jerusalem. Now that's a little phrase that's going to explain one of the major, di uh, uh, we could say, we probably use the word split, but one of the major disruptions of one of the first missionary teams in the scripture in the early church is Paul and Barnabas. And this little phrase here that John left them is going to become a major deal that is going to be irreconcilable and therefore remind us that in the context of community that is being formed and pursued by broken humans, Sometimes the way we keep the peace is by being willing to go separate directions and allow the ministry of the gospel to expand because of our petty inability to get past some difference we have together. That'll happen with Paul and Barnabas. So that's set that on the back shelf. We'll, we'll read that in a few chapters. Verse 14, they continued their journey from uh, Perga and reached um, Pisidian Antioch. On Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading, after the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. So the first thing that they do in their missionary journey is they go to the Jewish synagogue. And again, I know that I'm kind of repeating myself, but it's important to remember for his story, their story, this is the emphasis of the gospel. Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, and he declares that time and again, that that is the point of his mission. The commission of the disciples was to continue the mission, uh, the mission of Jesus to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is why before the ascension, Jesus says, you're going to take this good news of the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth. There is a progression in the way the mission is taking place. So, these first century Jewish Christians would go, first of all, to the Jewish synagogue, 
to preach the gospel. It's the only place they went, but they get priority to go into the Jewish synagogue. And it was not uncommon that if you were a local synagogue and a, a, a famous rabbi or teacher enters into the doors, and after you do the readings, you politely give an opportunity for that rabbi or for that teacher to stand up and speak a word of encouragement. This is exactly what's happened. This is what's happened to Paul. So what does Paul do? He immediately gets up and he launches into a sermon that has to do with the history of Israel. Now again, I don't want to go overly Bible nerd on you, but as we've looked through the book of Acts, if you'll recall, this is precisely what Peter does. Peter goes into a sermon that is rooted in the history of Israel because he understands that understanding that history is necessary for understanding and interpreting what is taking place in this new transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Whenever Stephen gets confronted right before he is martyred, go back and look at his sermon. He does the exact same thing. His evangelistic, evangelistic sermon goes back into a review of the history of Israel. And now we have a third speaker. Uh, it's the same author. Luke is writing yet another sermon on the lips of Paul this time rather than Peter or Stephen. And what is this sermon characteristic characterized by? Same thing. He's going to go back into the history of Israel in order to bring about for them a contemporary understanding of what God is doing in this transition from the old covenant to the new heavens and the new earth of the new covenant. And so, which is going to be complete, characterized by a completely different kind of an experience with God, which has to do with God's promise in his new covenant of putting his spirit into his people and changing their hearts, taking away the heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh. That instead of simply looking at God's laws externally written on stone, he's going to write the laws right on their very hearts. And so Paul goes back into their 16. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites, now what I have done here is in order to honor the scripture as it's being told, I have highlighted those words and phrases that remind us he, Paul is not giving a universal sermon. I, look, I don't want to throw too much out in one sermon and I don't want to unnecessarily make things difficult because we don't come to church to think. We come to church to be encouraged, and, and I respect that. But it's like when we read the story of Israel and we assume that we were under the bondage of the law of Moses and had to be rescued from it. That's a predominant theme in the scripture. My friends, you're Gentiles. You were never Old Covenant Jews called to submit to the law of Moses, awaiting a Savior that would deliver you from that which the law of Moses could never deliver you. you my friends, you are a post, glorious postscript to this story. If you like Marvel moody, movies, you're a post-credit scene. That's what our story is. This story is rooted in the story of this historical people. And so I've highlighted the words that help us remember that. Paul stood up, motioned with his hands, and he said, fellow Israelites. So immediately, by honoring his story and their story, we see that the audience relevancy of this text has specifically to do with Jews who are in the first century contemporary with Paul. So he says, fellow Israelites, you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors. Again, locating this speech within, with, with, with Paul's contemporary Jews and their history. Chose our ancestors made the people prosper doing, during their stay in the land of Egypt and led them out of it with a mighty arm. Now, if, you, if you're going to require that the Bible's only meaningful if you read your... Gone out. Do I need to grab a... Am I good? Okay. They're, they're on it back there. Um, 
So, so if you're going to read yourself, you got to read yourself as the Ammonites. You got to read yourself as the Egyptians. I mean, this is who you are. You're the Gentile tribes that get destroyed by the chosen people of God. That's where you are in the story. So, so, so here we are. He's, he says, our ancestors, they were led out of Egypt, and, uh, and he led them out of it with a mighty arm, verse 18. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. Never good when, when you move from God chose you and delivered you to he's putting up with you. And so that's where Paul transitions. He put up with them in the wilderness. Verse 19, and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. And now he's speaking specifically in their story about that generation of Israelites that were called out of, e out of Egypt and into the promised land. That's specifically who he's talking about and giving them their land as an inheritance. Verse 20. This all took about 450 years. After this, he gave them, Old Covenant Israel, judges until Samuel the prophet. Verse 21. Then they, Old Covenant Israel, asked for a king, and God gave them Saul the son of Kish a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years, verse 22. After removing him, he found David. I'm, I'm sorry, he raised up David as their, O covenant Israel, king, and testified about him. I found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out my will. From this man's descendants, he promised, as he, pro as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. Now that last line is very important. What is Paul saying? He fulfilled his promises to Israel. How did he fulfill his promises to Israel? He brought them their Savior, Messiah, Jesus. This is what the scripture says. This is what Paul is articulating. So let's break this down for a second. What have we learned from this section of Paul's sermon? Well, we've learned that God chose Israel. He chose Israel. You go back into the uh, story of Israel, particularly in their Genesis. You go back to the book of Genesis. You look in uh, Genesis chapter 12, and then I believe again in verse 15, the covenant that he makes with Abraham. And what we learn is that God chose Israel. But, but, but here is the calling of Israel. Israel was chosen to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Genesis 12, Genesis 15. Why did God choose Israel? What did he choose them to do? Be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Now, look at this for a second. This means they, O covenant Israel, are exclusively chosen to bear the Messiah who would bring God's inclusive blessing. They are exclusively chosen to bear the Messiah who would bring God's inclusive blessing. Exclusively, I'm picking you to be a blessing. Inclusively, a blessing to who? to all the families of the earth. Now, this is the first place that I've learned that we can go awry in our theology and doctrine. If you look at that statement, if you go back to Genesis 15, go back to Genesis 12, what you will discover is this. Israel's election is about responsibility, not salvation. That is so incredibly important because in getting that wrong, we go off on all kinds of confusion of what election and choosing means. But if you go back to the original place where this language is used, they are elected to be the exclusive people through whom the Messiah, who would bring about God's inclusive blessing, would come and bless the rest of the world. So their calling is not for exclusive salvation. 
Their calling is for exclusive responsibility to be the ones through whom God would bring Jesus, who would then inclusively bless all the families of the earth. Then we're told and we're reminded that it took over 450 years for God to work out this plan of establishing a king after his own heart. And this was just part one. This is just getting us to David. 450 years. And then we've got to continue to wait till the Messiah. Now, we don't have a lot of time to stop and pause and speculate, but do you ever wonder why an all-powerful God chooses so stinking long to bring about the fulfillment of his promise? And, and the writers of the New Testament, they recognize this tension because they will just say things like the mystery of the ages or in the fullness of time. Like there's no real way of putting our hands on what exactly does the fullness of time mean. It just means after a long time, God finally allowed Jesus to show up. So there's not a lot of direct explanation from the Bible. And so we're we're invited maybe to step back for a second and engage in the conversation. And after somewhat knowing myself for 47 years and working with other people and reading biographies and history, I just think it's because we're that stubborn. Like, it takes a really long time for us to figure out what doesn't work. And it takes us a really long time to realize Man-made religions of mediation don't transform the heart. What we need is a new covenant where God lives inside of us and he directs us by the leading of his Holy Spirit. But it took us a really long time to recognize what doesn't work in favor of what does work. Before raising up the Messiah, God first raised up David as king of Israel because he was a man after God's heart and one who would carry out God's will. Unfortunately, it's God's heart, and he didn't only carry out God's will, but that's for another sermon. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever. This promise becomes a very important promise in which the Israelites ground their hope particularly in times when they're being dominated by foreign lands. They hold on to this promise. So it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God promises David, one of his descendants, would sit on his throne forever. Paul teaches the Jews here in this sermon that Jesus was that descendant. See, in Jesus, fulfillment's taken place. Jesus is Israel's Savior who's coming was foretold to David. Jesus is Israel's Savior whose coming was foretold to David. Paul teaches his contemporary Jews that Jesus is the Savior. Now, now, and look at verse 39. This is so amazing how this is worded. Paul teaches his contemporary Jews that Jesus is the Savior that will free them from the sin from which the law of Moses could not free them. Now, we're going to read it in just a moment, but if you want to glance ahead, you'll see it right there in verse 39. Jesus is the Savior that finally frees them from that which they could never be freed through the law of Moses. When Paul preaches to Gentiles in Acts 17, uh, this is kind of a, oh, I've got to go quick. Mm, but i got to mention this. We're going to look at Acts 17 in a few weeks. When Paul preaches to the Gentiles in Acts 17, he speaks a very different salvation narrative. Now, if you're just curious, like, whoa, uh, hang on. No, it's all uniform. I know they put it together in a track, summed it up with a prayer at the end, so everybody was speaking uni universally the same narrative. Eh, wrong. You guys didn't do very well in your church history exam this morning. It's not true. There are different ways that this narrative is explained, and you can see between uh, Acts 13 and Acts 17 that Paul approaches the salvation narrative very different according to the audience to whom he's speaking. So uh, in Acts 17, he speaks a very different salvation narrative. And in that narrative, it begins with the revelation of the nearness of the unknown God. For the Jews, the revelation is the nearness of the God that they have known. 
For the Gentiles, it's a revelation of the, of the unknown God. He says it all right there in Acts 17. And I know some of you are like, you better pull this together already. Okay, we're coming back to a point. And then I see a few of you Bible nerds out there. You're just salivating. Your mouths are dripping. You're dabbing your brows. Um, in fact, in Acts 17, I'll just give you this little titillating piece of facts. In Acts 17, Paul quotes from a pagan poet as his source of authority to reveal that those Gentiles are the offspring of the God in whom they live and move and have their being. Well, I thought God was not with those godless pagans until we come in evangelism and evangelize them. I mean, I don't know exactly which theological pipe you put this in to smoke it, but I'm just saying, if we look at the scriptures, that's not how Paul understood them. He says, look, you have this idol to an unknown God. You don't know who he is, but you're his offspring. And in him, you live and you move and you have your being. This is the God I came to reveal to you, to testify to you about. All right, Acts 13, back to Acts 13. 24, rest of his sermon to his contemporary Jews. Before his coming to public attention, John, the first Baptist, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance. To who? To all the people of who? Israel. John's baptism of repentance is not for Gentiles who did not grow up under the old covenant. This was a specific baptism for the people of Old Covenant Israel at the time. All the people of Israel, verse 25. Now, as John was completing his mission, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one, but the one who's coming after me, and I'm not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race. See, see how the Bible goes out of its way? Abraham's race. And those among you who fear God, it is to us this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Oh, that's interesting. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. Now, I gotta calm, calm down, Artie. Whew. This is a place for polite conversation and then pizza by buffets. But if we read the scripture, it answers a lot of questions that Bible Belt Christians seem to be preoccupied with asking. Like one of this, does he still feel the nails every time I fail? Ever been told that? You sin, it's just like picking up that hammer again and driving in those nails. We have an answer. The answer is no. He doesn't still feel the nails every time you fail because you didn't do it. It is, it is a false, ridiculous manipulation of condemnation to say to a group of believers who are supposed to be liberated by the gratuitous grace of God that when you fail, he remembers the nails all over again. Body Christian. This is not what the Bible teaches. We didn't do this. There were people who were responsible for doing it, and they lived in the first century. But here's what's remarkable. The message to them, the ones that actually did drive in the nails, guess what they get told? Fear not, I forgive you. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the judgment of God. God has spoken his judgment over them, and it's, I forgive you. So verse 29, when they carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. 
But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you, our contemporary Jews, the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. Verse 33, this may be one of the most important phrases for Bible Belt Christians to read in order to understand the New Testament. Verse 33, God has fulfilled this for us. God has fulfilled this for us. Some of you, I've just bought you back a lot of time in your week because you don't have to keep reading or watching or listening to so-called Bible prophecy teachers that are still trying to convince you that Paul was wrong here. Still trying to convince you that God has in fact not fulfilled his promises to Israel. And therefore, we need to be watching all the things in politics that might hint to when God will finally get up and do something about his promises. In defiance to what the New Testament scriptural writers are telling us, which is that God fulfilled this for us. He fulfilled those promises for us, their children. And how did he fulfill those promises? By raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. I am your father. As to his raising from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken, it, spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Oh, another fulfillment word. I'm going to give the promises of David to you. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your Holy One see decay. For David, and, and now his point is simply this, he can't be talking about David here, he's talking about someone else. Verse 36, for David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, my contemporary Jews, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified or made righteous or put right or my personal favorite synonym is freed from everything that you could not be justified freed from, made right from, through the law of Moses. So this good news is first and foremost for that generation of transition that's moving from laboring under the final days of the old covenant into the new heavens and the new earth of this new covenant that God, where God is fulfilling the promises that he made to them which is why Acts starts out with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Paul calls the Jews to repent and trust that God has sent their Savior to save them from their sins. In particular, God raised Jesus from the dead to vindicate his offer of forgiveness for their having orchestrated his death. That, that's the gospel message. You killed him, but God raised him up. Now repent and embrace forgiveness, the forgiveness that he offers. God has given them the promises made to their ancestors. God has proclaimed to them the forgiveness of sins through Jesus. God has given them the holy and sure promises of David. If they will trust him, God will justify them from everything that they could not be justified from through the law of Moses. But make, make no mistake, my friends. The gospel message for the first century Jew is that God has fulfilled his promises to Israel in their generation. Once again, 32 and 33, we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, 
Let's pause there and let that soak in before we land the plane and dismiss this morning. One of the most detrimental assumptions we can make in terms of our posture toward mission is to think that what we're called to do is sit in meetings and hide and wait and pray for the big thing God's going to do in the future. I've been part of groups for years that are waiting for the big thing. For some of them, it's reading the signs of the times and, um, you know, getting ready for that red heifer to be rebred so the temple can open back up as though God wants sacrifices that declare the inefficiency of the sacrifice of Jesus. It, it just doesn't even make sense to me that as believers we fall for this stuff. That, that God's going to go backwards, open up a temple where they're sacrificing animals again, but there are groups that are watching for it. They'll send you a link to the conspiracy articles that tell us all about the things that are taking place in order to get this all up and running again. Or for the groups that miss their children's upbringing because they're in meetings praying for hours waiting for God's big revival that's supposed to come around the corner. And I read the scripture especially over the past five years and, and every page what jumps out to me is that you are called to live out the reality of what God's already done in the big thing he accomplished in the past, which he removed every barrier between us and himself. My friends, there's no greater thing that God can do. If you want revival, just believe in what he's done and start living like it's true. I promise you, you will immediately experience revival. And the revival that you're hoping will come poured from the sky and fix our nation will see erupt from inside of yourself as you represent yourself in the world in such a way that you are representing Christ and you are proclaiming the good news of what he has already done in the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins and the invitation of intimacy, life, and oneness with him. My friends, God has done the great thing he's going to do. You are not waiting for him to revive you. He is waiting for you to walk in his truth. And, and my concern is that in Bible Belt Christianity, we have created a spirituality that completely robs us of the joy of what God has accomplished by perpetually utilizing marketing psychology to make us feel that we are still lacking something. And whatever it is you're deficient in, a teacher, a prayer warrior, a book, a seminar, they have what you need to make up for the insufficiency of Jesus. And I just don't buy it anymore. I don't buy any spiritual formation perspective that has to first sell me on the inefficiency of what Jesus has done. If that's your starting point, I just don't want what you're selling because that's not what revealed here in the scriptures. But now I'm not saying that there's not a choice to respond to because look at how he wraps, us his, wraps up his sermon. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away, because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. And as they were leaving, people urged them to speak matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, 
who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The only thing that will prevent them from experiencing God's new covenant work is their refusal to believe it. Do you see that? The only thing that will keep them from experiencing God's new covenant work is their refusal to believe it. Now, that refusal to believe can come in several ways. Maybe the refusal comes to believe comes from the fact that you're an unbelieving cynic and you don't trust any of this. But there's another way that I can rob you from the joy of what God has accomplished by tempting you to unbelief, and it's to say that it hasn't happened yet. Wait for it. Pray for it. Prepare for it. Get a bunker and get ready so that you have all the food when no one else does. 20 years shelf life food that will last for seven years with a small fee of $3,000 a bucket. That's a true offer, my friends. Use the Google and find it. True offer. Well, that's one way for me to lock you into a lifetime of never actually tasting the goodness of God because you don't recognize what you've already been given because you've been taught to wait for it and wait for the big thing God's going to do in the future while missing that he's already done the thing that he's going to do and you're invited to live in light of it. The gospel call is not a fear-rooted run from hell, but a life-affirming call to run into the embrace of divine love. The Bible shows us we're created to be recipients of God's love, and we will never operate as intended without resting in his love. Would the worship team come forward as we get ready to close? So then, you've spent all morning talking about the past, what could that possibly mean for us today? I'm glad you asked as we were closing. A few suggestions for your journey. Number one, allow the scriptures to inform your understanding of the gospel. I don't expect anybody to agree with me just because I say something. But what I implore you as your pastor is to make certain that your understanding of the gospel isn't informed by trite, truncated gospel messages that are handed to you in a cartoon pamphlet. But rather, allow the scriptures to inform your understanding of the gospel. Embrace the divine invitation to be grafted into the forgiven community of God. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, go back and read Romans 9, 10, and 11. Embrace the divine invitation to be grafted into the forgiving community of God. And finally, and possibly most importantly, nurture your identity as the dwelling place of God. So that when you are asked to reflect upon your self-concept, this is one of the first things that come to your mind. Who are you? I'm the dwelling place of God. That's who I am. Who are you? I'm the place where God lives. Who are you? You are forever forgiven now live like it. You are the dwelling place of God. Now live like it. And remember that your brother, your neighbor, and your enemy possess the image of God. And they are also the dwelling place of God. Treat them like it. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body. You take and eat in remembrance of me. Then he poured the wine and said, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me.